Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Mini Magna Overcoming Challenges in Reef Keeping. It is now my great honor to present Sally Jo Headley. Sally Jo will be presenting with the theme of past challenges in reef keeping. Sally is a president and executive director of the Geothermal Aquaculture Research Foundation, GARF. Many of you have seen her website, garf.org, over the decades, and she's here to tell us about Save a Wild Reef, Grow a Captive One, a 30-year journey of captive coral care at GARF. A reminder, if you have questions during Sally Joe's talk, to go to magna.org slash questions. And Sally Joe will be joining us today at the end of the main event to go ahead and answer any questions in a live Q&A. So go over to magna.org slash questions and submit your questions there for Sally Joe. And now, Sally Joe's presentation. Save a Wild Reef, Grow a Captive One, a 30-year journey by Sally Joe Headley. Okay? Strap on your life jackets. I'm going to take you on a 30-year journey that changed my life as well as made a tremendous positive impact on our ability to keep, sustain, and dare, I say, propagate so many of these amazing corals. So are you ready for this magic carpet ride? Leroy was my adoring hero. His knowledge about our natural wetlands and the oceans is what captured my soul and feels it yet today. I know how honored he would be if he could be standing or sitting beside me right now. So with everything inside of me, I'm going to bring our journey to life and express the passion shared, the lessons learned, and make some suggestions about future changes needed and the almighty commitment we all must agree to when bringing this life into our homes. Some of you may already be a little familiar with my saltwater and reef tank beginnings, so I will try and make this very short and very sweet. I met Leroy when I was employed as the executive director for the Idaho Botanical Garden. One role that I had as my responsibility as director was to oversee the educational programming for students going on site field trips. Their favorite focal point was without hesitation, the garden's ponds. They would get so close to the edge, I was so scared one of them would fall in. Leroy would come almost every day and volunteer to work on the ponds. If the school children were present, he would always take the time to answer any questions their visit vivid minds would think of. I've always held on to the fact that children's questions are our treasures. They need to be heard and they need to be answered. One day, as I was guiding a field trip of young students, when we approached the ponds, this ever so precious girl pointed at some little tiny creatures moving in the water. She shouted, look at all the tadpoles. It only took a second until this boy shouted, those aren't tadpoles, those are pollywogs. No sooner did the next second pass and this little girl put her hand on her hip and looked at me and asked, what's the difference between a tadpole and a pollywog? I looked at her and said, hold on to that question. Just for a minute, I'll be right back. The other tour guide took over as I ran to find Leroy. When I found Leroy, I quickly, quickly inquired, what is the difference between a tadpole and a pollywog? He turned to me and said, one is a toad and one is a frog. I declared, no, it cannot be. I do not know why I dared. Uh, argue with the expert, but I did. All I knew was they were all born at the same time and in the same location. We both ran into the office, started up the computer, and looked up Tadpole. When Tadpole came up, it said these words, same thing as a polywog. As my heart was racing, so too was my brain. By the time I reached the field trip and the young lady waiting for an answer, I caught my breath long enough to say, you know how some people call a baby a baby, and some call them an infant, some call them a newborn? Well, the same is true for polywogs and tadpoles. They are both the life cycle of frogs or toads. The tadpole is what comes first after the eggs hatch, for it has no legs yet, but it does have a tail. The name polywog comes to the frog or toad once it starts to develop legs. This happens when the polywog is about nine weeks old. Leroy had caught some and put them in a net and placed them in a bowl of pond water. It was clear they were tadpoles, for they had no legs yet. This is how my ocean journey truly began. This chance encounter is what changed my life and that of the hobby of captive reef care for generations to come. Leroy's knowledge about wetlands and the ocean is what filled my passion. Soon Leroy was gifting me with books about the ocean. My brain became a sponge. I had so many questions that the books did not answer, nor could Leroy. This is when I turned to Mother Nature, for her answers are not found in a computer, nor are they found in a book. It is the interaction. It is a watching, the witnessing, the touching, the smelling, and the que questions that lead to the answers. In no time at all, a team was formed. Leroy focusing on everything wet as I was focusing on everything alive. 
we decided that as a team, we should dedicate our lives to help save our wild reefs one captive reef at a time. At the same time Leroy and I would visit the ocean, we were caring for reef tanks all over town. It did not take long for me to realize that even if someone invested their hard-earned income, bought the best equipment, in one year's time, all they had left was equipment and a message from their wife, either you go or that tank goes. No one enters this hobby, nor do they stay in the hobby, to watch animals die one by one, only to watch the lights and filters work. I had absolutely no experience in the hobby of reef keeping, yet I was so willing to roll up my sleeves to learn, to study, and research, and turn my green thumb blue. In 1993 to 1995, as we would visit our beloved oceans, the crisis of coral bleaching was impacting our wild reefs in ways never experienced. Reefs in all parts of the world were in decline. Even reefs that were far away from populations were bleaching. It is so sad, so disheartening, and without question so wrong. I must make this comment right here and right now. The more we understand about the ocean, about her suffering, the better chances we have for hope to aid her in her mighty recovery for generations to come. In honesty, I cannot think of one single person who in some way is not impacted directly or indirectly by our wild reefs, all the way from food to oxygen it creates to the structure itself. And one very important role we must never forget is the advances being made in the biomedical research field. So as my journey begins, the subject of my passion is dying. I had to put on my thinking cap and start finding ways to help our wild reefs, for they truly are what sustains our lives. Knowing that everything that enters our captive world comes from the wild, this was a true stumbling block for me. For if our wild resources are in jeopardy, why would we risk bringing in something that could wipe out everything in captivity? As I was pondering on this question, it is what brought Garf to where it is today, studying our oceans, following what was coming out of our ocean and gracing our captive systems. How it was traveling, unloaded, and shipped out to any tank owner was one of my top priorities. Every single step we've taken was to try and take the burden off of our wild reefs and to work to find ways to make our captive reefs successful so that anyone anywhere who has a desire to have the reef tank of their dreams can make their dream come true. I may share mer many messages with you today, but one I want to make completely 100% clear is the fact that if I can do this, so can you. Everything from making plenums, to making rock, to making plugs, to curing rock, to making lights, to propagating hundreds of different types of coral, growing bugs, macroalgae, and all the tasks I still perform yet today. If I can do it, so can you. All of this information is on garf.org and shared freely with the whole world. It is hard to pinpoint where all my ideas and questions come from. Every time I would visit the ocean, I would walk away with a deeper understanding. It was not what was coming out of the ocean, but what was going in that was causing its demise. Our mighty ocean is fighting so many battles from so many directions, but to just stop people from having any access to it is not going to save this resource that provides us life period. It was time for me to go back to reading the books, for I had so many darn questions. The more I read, the more confused I became. For one book would say to set up a tank one way, the next book would say, no, do it this way. I would compare what I read to what I witnessed as we were caring for different tanks in town, and what I witnessed directly from Mother Nature herself. It just did not match. The books and the life we bring into our care, the steps that were being taken, were leading to so much death, so much loss, so much failure, and sadly, so many people who had their hearts in the right place turned away from the hobby, for not only did it drain their pocketbooks, it tore right through their souls. Perhaps this is how I can best explain what I'm trying to convey. Let us start with the subject of live rock. Every single book I read said you needed high-powered lights to set up that ever-so-perfect reef tank. People saved paycheck after paycheck until they could afford metal halide bulbs, VHO bulbs, power compacts, etc. This made absolutely no sense to me for all of these reasons. The live rock that was coming from the ocean was coming from deeper down in the ocean, not on the top of the reef crest like the high-powered lights were made to reflect. The live rock that was being transported was out in the open air, depending upon where it was coming from, would define for how long. When the rock was shipped, sometimes delayed in shipping, and to my horrible dismay, when I visited several of the wholesalers, right before my eyes were boxes unopened that said fully cured live rock. 
How long it sat there before shipping to a pet store is anybody's guess. Now, it does not take a real scientist to understand that the so-called live rock, once blasted by high-powered lighting, is going to cause problems from day one. If there was anything on the rock that was still alive, it would smell up the entire house. You could see a cloud cloud of water in your tank, and each time you dared to peek into your tank, more and more death was occurring. If all of this was not bad enough, a high-powered skimmer was a must. Anything alive, not only bad but good, was being skimmed out before the tank could even begin to mature. In no time at all, hitchhikers would start occupying the rock and spreading like wildfire. Fire. Soon it was on the sand and covering everything. Setting up a new tank was not only hair pulling, nail biting, but left more people turning their back on the hobby more than anything else I can think of. For people did their research, all that was available to them at the time. They bought the best lighting, the best filters, even in their hearts and minds, the best premium live rock supposedly being fully cured. I cannot count how many times I watched the same scenario repeat itself. I simply wanted no part of this, for not only was it destructive, but it was also taking away the foundation of our beloved ocean's fortress, the homes of so many of our corals, and the perfect hiding places for our fish to play in and plan for the next generation. Leroy time and time again tried to get me to set up a tank of my own. He must have asked a thousand times, pulling at every heart string in my being. I simply could not, would not place something in my care only to watch it slowly disappear and be lost forever. I honestly did not need to, for I could see and hear about it all around me. In 1994 through 1995, the U.S. outlawed live rock harvesting in the U.S. oceans. Instead, the rock farmers dumped rock from different parts of the world into the ocean and would wait for it to come to life. This did not resolve my biggest worry, which is the risk one continues to take when taking something from the natural ocean when the life within it is barely hanging on. On February 14, 1995, Leroy was acting like a young boy in a candy store. He would not let me in my office and continually tried to kick, keep me out of certain sections of our lab. I knew he was up to something, but had no idea what. Leroy covered my eyes with a blindfold and guided me into my office. He said, take in a deep breath, and when I tell you, open your eyes. I followed his instructions perfectly. When I opened my eyes, there was an empty tank right in front of me. Leroy, with as much excitement as a human can contain, said, now you have to set up a reef tank. I don't know where the words were summoned from, but I said, only if we take nothing from the ocean. We had already begun the research into making our own rock. We started by studying the material used to make bridges in the ocean. While doing this research, we were mindful of finding material that anyone in just about any country could find so that anyone anywhere in the world, if they so desired, could make their own rock. I was even brave enough to dream of the day that rock could be made outside of the ocean, placed inside of the ocean, allowed to grow, and 60% of the rock made could be pulled up and sold, but the remaining 40% would remain so new habitats could colonize and new generations would begin. I was told there was no way possible to start a tank without taking anything directly from the ocean. I was told that man-made rock will never ever work. The list of you cannot do things was overshadowed quickly for years as we one by one proved, oh yes, it can be done, and look, here are all the results. We share step by, instruct step by instructions on how to make your own rock, how to cure your own rock on our website. It works, not just for us, but tanks across the world have been setting up using this method. Still today, the rock we made over 30 years ago is a foundation to all the reefs I sustain. Going back to what I learned when visiting our natural reefs, it was clear as can be that the ocean has definite seasons. When I would visit the ocean in the springtime, some of the rock was so slippery and slimy, completely covered with mats of algae. You could barely keep upright. Two months later, you could go back to the same location the algae was gone. Not one speck of it on the rocks. Oh, but the heroes of keeping and maintaining a balance in our open oceans and the janitors of our closed systems were at work. There were baby hermits and snails everywhere. You could go back to the very same location months later and the rock would be covered with the most incredible macroalgae of all shapes and colors. It reminded me of the fall time in Idaho when all the leaves started turning colors. Finally, you can go back to the same spot and the macros are gone, but the hermits and snails have been feasting on their natural gift of nourishment. 
Mother Nature did not forget one detail, where she figured out how when one creature gets out of hand, another one will take care of it, and the balance is naturally achieved. I will never forget the time Leroy was standing in front of my tanks, all set up with nothing from the ocean. He looked at me and said, how come your tanks never get any algae? Without thinking about what I was saying, the words just rolled out of my mouth, because I never put it in there. When we set up the first bulletproof reef tank with all man-made rocks seated with our captive life sand, we had no idea all the miracles of life it would grace each tank with. The first part of our mission, to take the burden off of our natural reefs for a captive system, was no longer a dream. It is a reality. Oh, what fun it is to make your own rock. You simply cannot make any mistakes. Be as creative as you want to be. Our first rocks were made in the shape of caves and arches. Over time, we designed tables so that there were areas in your tank where there were no dead spots. I have continued to add new designs knowing that in no time at all, this rock is going to be covered with life. Just recently, I came up with a new idea, and that was to use some of my age fully cured rock in my freshwater tanks. They are stunning beyond belief. The bonus is that you can see the rock and it does not become covered with life like it does in the reef tanks. Anyone, young or old, can enjoy playing in their own beach box. It is a perfect time to engage your children to make rock and at the same time explain to them why it is so important to make the rock and leave the live rock in the ocean as it is a foundation to all life that sustains our lives. We make our rock inside of boxes we use for shipping, for we found out that the longer the day went on, the bigger the rocks became. Not only would they not fit in our tanks, but they would not fit in the boxes for shipping. It is important to follow the instructions on allowing the rock time to set before you uncover them. If you remove them too fast, they will break. Another thing you should not rush is the curing process, for you need to allow the pH of the rock to stabilize. We do this by placing our rock in fresh water and daily replacing the water for six weeks. I never, ever rush this step. It is also true your man-made rock is only as good as the live sand that you add to your tank, for coralline algae must be introduced into one system. There are several ways to achieve this. One is by live sand, another scraping from older tanks, another even water from an older system for coralline spreads by spores. The other gift of life sand is the beneficial bacteria, spores of sponges, the sand stirs, and the life yet to hatch to keep and maintain that delicate natural balance. Over the years, we've developed so many ways to add corals to the man-made rock by the holes that we create in them. The holes are the same size as the plugs we use to grow our corals on. This and so much more is shared throughout our website, garf.org. There are so many gifts that the man-made rock provides. No unwanted algae, no hitchhikers. You can propagate corals easier for you can break off a piece of the rock with the coral cutting and the list of gifts grow with each new tank. It is just so darn rewarding looking into your captive system and knowing that you grew it all yourself to know exactly what is going into your system and keeping the hitchhikers and pests out of your tank. Finally, knowing that the foundation of our natural reefs did not have to be removed to create your very own indoor ocean. Any rock coming from the ocean when the tank conditions are perfect will react just like they do in their natural environment. When first setting up our reef tanks, we fear the diatom blooms. But do you realize that in our ocean, if there were no diatoms or algae present, 20% of the world's ocean oxygen would be lost? With everything we do reef, it is all about finding a balance, that perfect balance that Mother Nature defined. She did not miss one detail. For when it comes to algae, she created something to eat it. Even with the perfect conditions of man-made rock and captive sand, one can get diatoms, cyanobacteria, and other algae issues. It is a matter of thinking of how Mother Nature found ways to control these blooms naturally. Reef janitors, be it hermits, snails, fish, bugs, macros, and any other natural filters are so darn critical to helping you achieve and sustain that ever so precious natural balance. This is where I want to go back to the first statements I made. Oh, there's tremendous excitement when we, the tank finally arrives. One can barely wait to fill it up with rocks, sand, water, corals, and fish. It is the first steps you take when setting up your tank that are the true foundation of your reef. If I had the ability to bottle up patients and sell it 
in liquid form, I would have the hidden treasure all tanks need. For a reed tank to take hold so that it can sustain life takes time. It takes time for the rock to age and support life. It takes time for the life sand to grow, all the beneficial bacteria and sandsters to help maintain a natural balance. We tend to rush everything in the hobby. We're shed, we tend to fil filter out the life needed to support the growing colonies of bacteria, bugs, coralline, sponges, and the foundation of our dream reef tank. Yet it is a simple gift of maturity that aids our fish to live longer, allows our corals to thrive, our bugs to hatch, our rock and sand to develop that natural filter that our ocean has proven time and time again works. A reef tank needs to be planned for always keeping in mind what it is you are wanting to sustain. Know what size tank the animals or fish will need, what life they need inside the system, be it growing plants to forage on or bugs to feast on. All of this takes time to grow. If we compare setting up the foundation of our reef tank to building our house, it is a foundation that allows us the years of dreams yet to come. When we build our house, we do not start with a roof or a bedroom or bathroom. We start with pouring the foundation, allowing it to cure and set. It is that foundation, that very foundation that holds up the walls, the roof, the children yet to come. The rock and sand you place in your new tank is so important to start the first big step to nurturing a fish only system or a thriving reef tank. It takes time, meaning even live rock that comes from an aquaculture system takes time to be able to sustain life. Oh, way too often we set up our tanks backwards, starting out what, with what is needed down the road when the rock and sand and animals are really mature. All the money spent on equipment, lighting, and livestock will come in good time. The most important investment you can grace your tank with when you first set it up is time. Instead of using high-powered lighting, start out with lower lights. This encourages the sand and rock to grow. It encourages coralline algae to grow, spread, and thrive. It gives you the chance to grow several soft corals, leather corals, mushrooms, and a whole host of corals. That by the time your tank is truly aged enough to sustain the small polypostony corals or large polypostony corals, you can propagate some of the soft jewels and trade them for an upgraded lighting system. Another lesson learned is that we often make our tanks way too sterile when we first set up our tanks. We go out and purchase a high-powered skimmer, perhaps a UV sterilizer, and other filtering material. If we are relying on our live sand to bring life to our man-made rock, or if we're trying to get our rock to take hold, we were skimming out not only what is bad, but what is good, the beneficial bacteria that is needed to help sustain your reef tank for years to come needs to be established not pull directly out of your tank before it gets a chance to truly colonize. If you think about the gift of our ocean and how she started, it took ages and ages. Now, yes, we have caused her to be out of balance by our own actions. It is the foundation in our captive system that needs to be considered before we bring in any fish or coral. Our closed systems do not have the same give and take like our oceans have. It does not take much at all to make a new system struggle to find a balance. We tend to overload them and ask them to do a balancing act that even the greatest trapeze artists cannot sustain. When the tank arrives, we simply want to fill it up, forgetting that the fish or coral we bring home may be small, but in no time at all, they do grow. We want to go from zero to hero, forgetting that time, maturity, and patience needs to be what you fill your tank with first. This is the perfect time to get to know your tank. Remember that testing your water is, in, is as important on day one as it is on year 20. It is so important to wait for the display tank to mature, paying close attention to water parameters. Use this time to learn to know your system, like how much water evaporation takes place, what temperature swings your system encounters, and learn how to use your test kits, for your test kits will be your guide when something is wrong. Watch and always be on the lookout for any unwanted hitchhikers that come in on your rock or your live sand. Make sure you have power heads breaking the top surface water for oxygen is needed both day and night. I found that oxygen demands at night put even more strain on the system for the bacteria and plants that create oxygen during the day take it up at night. We 
think, well, if I start out with a small tank to learn from, it will save me money and time. Please, please remember a small tank is a challenge tank. Only so much can truly go in it. A healthy, thriving reef tank reflects the natural reefs. It is made up of biodiversity, not biomass. A small reef tank can cost more, take more time, and be far more challenging than any bigger system. I like to think of caring for a reef tank like raising our own children. They are a true commitment, one that needs constant care nurturing and passion. Having said that, our children do not wear the same size shoes all their lifetime. We allow our children to grow and their needs to grow and we grow with them. When I read all the books in the hobby, I never once read any material on how our tank should progress, how one would benefit from starting out with lower lighting, no skimming. Take this time to focus on growing your sand, aging your rock, growing coralline algae, allowing bugs to hatch, and the tank foundation to come to life. Again, this is a closed system. At first, you're begging animals to live and thrive. Once the tank is mature and all the animals are growing, there are indeed new challenges to face. While you wait for your display tank to mature, it is a perfect time to set up your spa, your resort. Okay, the dreaded quarantine tank. The quarantine tank has such a bad rap with so many people, but it is one of the most critical steps needed for long-term success. I remember when someone said their animals were in quarantine, the comment was met with, oh no, you have a virus or a plague? It did not take long for me to understand that this is one way to prevent it from reaching your display tank. This is an expression of love and support. It represents how you will gift your livestock the nurturing they cannot do for themselves and rely on you to do for them. There are so many hitchhikers, so many infections, so many protozoa that we risk bringing into our established tanks if we do not take the step. Far too many tanks have lost not only all the money invested, but the time, energy, and love devoted to caring for an indoor ocean. One fish, one coral, one macroalgae, one rock, any life form that is new to our systems need to be watched, spoiled, cared for, and treated if need be. You need to do your research as to what to watch for, which fish diseases, what coral hitchhiker, unwanted guest on your live rock or live sand, for each creature can bring home new challenges. I would also like to stress that not all answers are found in a bottle. I've avoided any chemicals and found natural ways to control any prey with a predator who will aid me in finding and keeping that ever so delicate natural balance. You must remember if you try treating the display tank with chemicals, what effect will it have on the good bacteria you have aged? What effect will it have on the tiny little zoosanthili that resides inside of every polyp on every colony of coral? Know what to watch for and what methods you would use to control any problems that arise. You cannot think that a captive race coral is free from diseases, nor a mariculture coral or an aquaculture coral, or even your best friend's gift of a coral. Fish are the same, even if they're captive bred. Some of the conditions they are grown in treat for diseases. Then they go to the wholesalers, and who knows what kind of water they have. The same is true for the quality pet stores they, that say all fish are fully quarantined. All our livestock travel distances, often most adjust to different systems. Stress is one of the major factors that cause problems to our new arrivals. No pet store, wholesaler, mariculture facility, nor any hobbyist can declare that anything is fully quarantined. The only way you can truly know when something is safe and ready to place in your display tank is to do the quarantine process yourself. It is not punishment, it is life sustainment. One more comment comes to mind. I remember when I spent hours picking out a fish. I almost made the mistake of putting the water the fish came in inside of my tank. My thinking was it was a pet store. It had to have perfect water. For heck, it tests customers' water all the time. Leroy caught me and informed me that you have no idea what chemicals might be in that water. Don't let one drop of water go into your tank. Remember to ask questions and try to match the conditions the animals coming from with your system. Ask what they're feeding them or if any chemicals have been used. I can only offer this one suggestion. I have heard it over and over again how somebody has rescued an animal. 
I know how hard it is to refuse trying to save an animal that looks like it needs help, but this often leads to not only a challenge, but the introducing of something that could cause problems down the road. When your tank has finished the nitrogen cycle and is ready for any fish or coral, please do your research. You must consider that your new tank will not have the bugs or fauna, so make sure the fish or coral will thrive without the natural food that will come down the road. Make sure that this new arrival do not need a tank full of bugs and fauna or soft coral that can easily adapt to a new system. Study the fish and their needs. Study the corals and their needs. We cannot ask the fish to fit into our needs. Rather, we must meet the needs of our fish and other livestock we bring into our care. Research planning and making the perfect home for these animals will provide you for years of enjoyment. At the same time, you can continue to plan for the dream yet to come. Build up to that amazing dream, and oh my word, you can have so much fun doing so. For the animals and creatures that hatch out from the live sand captivates me, yet more importantly, sustains the life that surrounds me. The first corals you place in your tank, the term beginner corals are used. There's a reason for this. These animals do incredibly well uh, with a new tank. They do not need the powerful lighting you may de need down the road, depending upon the animals you wish to, to sustain. They do not need a skimmer. As a matter of fact, they do so much better when fed or can consume some waste for, from fish or leftover food. The beginner corals need room to grow and branch out, so this is a perfect time to add them to your system. Just as important as quarantine is, so too is doing your research, planning, knowing the needs of the animals and making sure your system can meet those needs is a key to the toolbox of success. Another exciting fact is that by the time your tank is aged and mature enough, you can actually propagate some of your jewels and trade them for an upgraded lighting system or a skimmer or even animals that you do not already have. Each Valentine's Day, Leroy would surprise me with yet another empty tank. This is a picture of my second bulletproof reef tank, which I would quickly start out with our live sand, our man-made rock, and make cuttings from the first bulletproof. It was impossible to find captive reef soft corals when I first began in the hobby back in 1995, so I had to become doctor, surgeon, and caregiver. A big, huge gift graced our hobby when coral propagation began. Instead of huge wild corals stretched from shipping, we now can find smaller colonies that do not add so much biomass, and you can add more than one at a time and have fun watching them grow. We have so many choices, from online sources, clubs, fragging corals, to mariculture corals, visiting our pet stores, or from fellow hobbyists sharing their own rewards. It is just so incredible witnessing how fast the mother colon re colony regenerates and how fast the baby starts to grow and even often outgrows the original mother colony. I do not add any of this large polypstony corals or small polypstony corals to my new tanks until the tank is mature and ready for upgrades. I use this rule of thumb that when the coralline algae is about the size of a quarter spreading on the front glass, your tank is ready for the large polypstony corals or the more delicate SPS corals. But you should be ready to invest in more lighting and some more filtering equipment. As impossible as it was to find soft corals or beginning corals when I entered the hobby in 1995, it was equally impossible to find large polystony corals, and even some of the small polystony corals were rare. If you could find any large polystony corals, they were all wild, and they were huge, and so stressed. The rare small polystony corals that were captive raised were tiny, very costly, and limited in variety. This is a picture of my third boat for reef tank. Each one of my tanks and the hundreds I've cared for, in no time at all, it became clear to me that in nature, one of the ultimate defenses an animal possesses are to outgrow its neighbor, who then rocks out light, water movement, captures food and space on the reef itself. The same even to a greater degree is true in our closed captive settings. What is clear is the fact that as animals grow, so too do their needs. It is not just a matter of water changes and supplements you use, for they will grow and block out light. You will either have to learn to propagate the corals as well as considering adding more lights. As the animals grow and block out water flow from their neighbors, you will have to propagate corals and add more water movement. 
by adding additional power heads and even perhaps some bubblers. Therefore, I learned over the years that when somebody asked me how I set up my tanks, I make it clear that what I start out with as far as equipment goes is not what I end up with over time. For each one of my systems, I upgrade the lighting, I add more power heads, I add more filters, and I'm constantly propagating the coral colonies, working on keeping the biodiversity and balance of each system. The ability to add captive race corals to our systems allowed us to be able to buy more than one coral at a time and allow them to have room to grow. They are less stressed and adjust to our captive settings so much easier. Having said that, it only works if you provide the right conditions for them. What I mean by that is just because you can purchase a captive raised small polyp stony coral or even a captive raised large polyp stony coral, they have completely different needs than any of the hardier soft corals or beginner corals. I stage my corals in I, as I make upgrades and the tank matures. Pay attention to the animals. They will let you know when they are not happy. Watch for polyp extension, coloring, growth, and anything that could be harming them. It could be placement, it could be predator. Some of them are extremely hard to see. It is the small things that bring forth the big things, the tiny bugs, the beneficial bacteria, the mini stars, the worms, and all the natural filters are just so darn important. To grow your own food allows you to know exactly what is going into your tank and what is nourishing your fish. You can grow your own green water, your macros, sponges, even some corals make the most amazing natural filters. Without them, it is almost impossible to sustain some of our fish and coral for as long as they can survive in their natural home. When your tank ages and matures, you can certainly add some of the most amazing color as you upgrade your lighting and your filtering. For the small pop stony corals are such an incredible, incredible gift. Added to the fact that now you can get propagated colonies that are smaller and can fit into your mature tank is even more of a gift. The same is true for some of the brightest large pop stony corals. For remember, the world's oceans are made up of biodiversity. There are soft corals living and thriving along with the small pulp stony corals and large pulp stony corals. When we bring something in from the wild, we must always think about what effect it will have on the animals that need them to thrive. The captive raised clownfish and the wild anemone is a perfect example, but there are several. The harlequin shrimp and the sea star are another example. If we continue to take the harlequin shrimp out of the ocean as fast as the sea stars multiply in captivity in the ocean, it would not take long for so many of our colorful SPS corals to be feasted on freely, for there is no longer the match of predator and prey. This dance between predator and prey is so fascinating and cannot be ignored. If you always remember to put the animal's needs first, you simply cannot and will not go wrong. Remember, this is a hobby and it should be so fun and rewarding. Gift your tank the time it needs to mature and it will gift you with years of miracles you've never expected. I have to also make this comment. What we used to think was conflicting information is not necessarily true, for there are so many ways to set up a reef tank. It is the animals you wish to, to sustain that should define how you set it up. Most of all of my answers to any tank questions begin with, it depends, for there is so much that goes into each decision you make. Another point I want to share with you is when you think something is wrong in your display tank, whatever changes you make, do them gradual and do them one at a time. Often we overreact and cause even more stress on a system or an animal that's asking for help. Maintaining water quality, making tank upgrades, and paying close attention to your animals for one thing never ever fails is that the animals always inform me when something is just not quite right. It is up to me to figure out what that something is. Water changes in test kits are critical to the long-term success of any captive reef tank. It is with sharing the success of GARF, I hope to continue to inspire others. If I can do it, so can you. You can have your very own captive reef tank without taking anything from our beloved oceans. You can have fun each and every step of the way. It is when the process is rushed that we lose so many hobbyists before they even get their first blue thumb. 
These next few slides are going to cover some issues that I think really need to be changed and some others that commitments need to be made and promises kept. Number one, for the life of me, I do not understand why cut flowers, mail, and coffins make it on the freight planes before our, our live animals do. Every time a shipment of livestock is accepted as freight, if there is an abundance of cut flowers, coffins, and mail, our precious animals get bumped until the next flight or next available spot. So many boxes arriving in Boise had this happen that I made our carrier promise to hold them indoors in temperature-controlled rooms. Leroy, on Valentine's Day, would present me with a new empty tank to fill up with all my new ideas. One time, I overheard him tell the freight companies that he was considering getting me a coffin to ship back and forth to safeguard our incredible animals. This needs to be changed. It is not right. I can only hope that before I truly am in a coffin that this one rule will change, for at least cut flowers could be held back before our live fish and coral, or the freight company should not accept the freight until there is indeed room for it to go on a plane on a secured spot. Number two, I would absolutely love to see DNA testing on all corals, for we have animals from different oceans in the same tank that in no way would ever meet. We could patent a brand new coral. How exciting would that be? I know DNA has started on zooxanthellae, but these strains are in constant change as we pass them past one coral from one captive tank to another. Number three, quarantine. Oh, that word brings some of the worst in the best of us. It is so huge in the long-term success of any captive reef. It should be looked at as having your fish or coral lifestyle visiting a resort, being pampered and nurtured until it meets its new neighbors. If only we could all reach the fact that quarantine is our duty if we wish to sustain the animals that sustain us. Learning what to look for when in their spa and how to naturally take care of the hitchhiker is also critical. Remember, not everything is found in a bottle. Number four, there has to be more education about wearing gloves and safety glasses, the siphon hose we use to move water. More people are ending up in emergency rooms where they either did not know how toxic these animals can be or simply are not are willing to take the risk. These, this needs to change. We need a complete understanding and commitment by everyone that wearing gloves and safety glasses when handling our beloved livestock is a must. At the same time, hoses used for siphoning water in and out of our tanks, we need to inform people the risk involved with getting any of this in their mouths. Finally, not putting animals, children, or people with compromised immune systems at risk. These animals do have some very strong defenses that they've had to use to make their mark on our reefs. When we handle them, we have no idea what toxins they can release or what effect it will have on any of us. As the hobby grows, so too do the dangers. But there are risks that just should not, and more importantly, need not be taken. Number five, and this one is huge. I mean, seriously huge. There needs to be an understanding, a promise reach that no animal that enters our captive system will be released into the wild waters of our oceans. For the lionfish alone has caused so much damage worldwide. They have no known predator. If we do not make this commitment, the tremendous strides we've made in captive care will be outweighed by the damage of fear of caused. This simply cannot be repeated ever. This is a drawing of one of my, that is found in one of my 12 children's books I've written and illustrated. I want to end with a thank you to all the wonderful people who made my journey so incredible. Merle Cohen, Aquarium Products, before he passed away, he graced our water world with over 200 amazing products, both for fresh water and salt water. Rick Greenfield, owner of Carib Sea, who has provided this hobby with the most amazing source of aragonite sand, crushed coral, and so many more products. Without him, there would be no man-made rocks. 
aquarium systems. I love their instant ocean salt. And so many of their wonderful products are used in public aquariums around the world and is used in all the systems at GARF. Dr. Morin of Seachem, for it is their supplements that fuel my bulletproof reef systems. Stanley Brown, who ran the Breeders Registry. Mike Paletta, who has shared so much passion and knowledge with reef clubs around the world. Julian Sprung and Charles Delbeck, their books are the Bibles of this hobby. Dana Riddle, oh, what a friend. He has always been ready to listen and answer my never-ending questions. Steve Tyree, this man is not only brilliant and been to several reef clubs around the world, but has also authored books about some of my favorite subjects, such as the natural filters, the sponges. Oh, Bob Finner, his wisdom and his sense of humor, there will never ever be a match. He was rare and one of a kind. This reef world will miss him daily. Albert Thiel, he is amazing, a true pioneer of yesterday and today. Jerry Hessling of Indian Pacific Sea Farm, the knowledge this gentleman has is just a huge gift to the hobby. Martin Moe, his knowledge about the ocean is priceless, and he has shared his passion in so many chapters of so many incredible books. Dick Perrin and Earl Curry are two more of my coral heroes. The online groups who give freely their time and their energy, answering questions, showing results, is just priceless. The marine clubs of the world coming together for the greater good of the hobby. I cannot help but express my love and deep, deepest, deepest appreciation for my dearly beloved Leroy, who passed away in 2012, but I still feel will walk in the door at any moment. It is when our hands are in the tank that I feel that our souls are touching. We are the looking glass into the world's oceans. They need all of us to be their voice. GARF has proven, without question, if you want to help save a wild reef, grow a captive one. We have shared the entire journey on our website. I just have to believe with everything inside of me, if we can sustain the life outside of the ocean with nothing natural, there has to be hope for our wild reefs. We are today's pioneers, embarking on a journey that is certain to change lives forever. It is what we learn, witness, and share that will create tomorrow's pioneers. Having the ability to watch, to research, to study, to learn in our captive systems would mean very little if we did not share our results, our successes, and even our failures with one another. I'm so proud of how far this hobby has come. We have reached harbors from ocean to ocean. We have proven that with the right tools, we can, we have, and we will continue to learn more about each animal in our care. What makes this possible is the care, the nurturing, the research, asking questions, seeking answers, never giving up, watching, learning, and sharing has been some of the most important factors that allow us to carry on in our captive systems. My promise is as real today as the day I started, and that is I will work with all the energy inside of me to help save our wild reefs one captive reef at a time. With the commitment, as long as there's a breath left inside of me, I will remain a voice for the animals that say so much in so many languages just by their actions. Remember always that Mother Nature is the best teacher of all. Perhaps most important is the fact that we are today's pioneers, paving the way for tomorrow's pioneers. My five all-time favorite messages that I still use today. If you can count how many corals you have, you don't have enough. It costs money to grow corals. More lights, more tanks, oh, and the higher the power bill. You can only make money when you sell them. If we do not have plants, we do not breathe. Furthermore, if we do not have water to water those plants, we cannot breathe. The solution to pollution is dilution. Remember, if I can do this, so can you. This has been an amazing 30 years. Let's not let this be an ending of a 30-year journey, but the beginning of someone else's 30-year journey. Thank you so much for your time and for being a part of our mission to help save our wild reefs one captive reef at a time. Sally Jo Garf, spelled backwards, frag. Thank you very much, Sally Joe, for that wonderful presentation. If you want to learn more about Sally Joe, you can go to macna.org and click on Mini Macna and look at Sally Joe's profile. Once again, if you have any questions about the presentation, you can go to macna.org questions 
and you can leave your questions for Sally Joe there.